I got on the next bus. I sat in the very last seat in the middle row. We began to drive out to the Golden Gate Bridge. And that's when it hit me. I realized I didn't want to die at all. I said, well, what are you doing, Kevin? Get off the bus. And so I'm sitting there and I'm crying my eyes out, hoping for one individual on this bus crowded with people to look at me and say, hey, kid, are you okay? Hey, kid, there's something wrong. Can I help you? I, I was walking up to the bus driver, hoping that he would see my pain. But I could not say it overtly. I could not tell him that I was in trouble. I could not make those sounds. And he looked at me. Come on, kid, get off the bus. I got to go. There was a guy to my left, said to the fellow next to him, while pointing at me with his thumb, what the hell's wrong with that kid with a smile on his face? I thought, that's it. Nobody cares. Nobody cares. A wave of emotion overcame me as I stepped down off of this bus. My feet heavy, my heart palpitating, waterfalls flowing out of my eyes. I walked forward. As I stood atop the Golden Gate Bridge walkway, staring and leaning over the four foot nothing rail, peering down to the looming waters below. I walked back toward the traffic. I ran as fast as I could, and I threw myself over the rail. The millisecond that my hands left that rail, instant regret for my actions. I fell 220 feet, 25 stories at 75 miles an hour in four seconds. I prayed on the way. What have I just done? I don't want to die. God, please save me. Father, on the morning up, he pleaded with me to be with him that day. He pleaded with me to just hang out because he could see something was wrong. And at six in the morning, I entered my dad's room and he looked at me and he goes, Kevin, what's wrong? And I desperately wanted to tell him the truth. And eventually I convinced my dad that morning that I was fine, knowing full well that I was going to the Golden Gate and I was going to die. He turned to me and he said one of his favorite things, Kevin, I love you, be careful. When you hit a vacuum, sucks you under 70 feet. My legs were completely immobile. I had shattered my lower vertebrae into shards like glass. I swam 70 feet with one breath and without the use of my legs. It was the fastest I ever swam because I knew I wanted to live. I break the surface, I bump up down in the water. I can't stay afloat. I keep going down. My boots are waterlogged. I cannot stay afloat. I'm going to drown. Praying the entire way, God, please save me. I don't want to die. I made a mistake. I broke the surface. God, please save me. I don't want to die. I made a mistake. Bobbed up and down in the water. God, please save me. I don't want to die. I made a mistake. I can't die here. If I die here, no one will ever know I didn't want to. No one will ever know I knew I made a mistake. And that is when something began to circle beneath me. It was large and very slimy and very alive. And I just was gonna die by a shark bite. It just kept circling faster and faster beneath me. No longer was I waiting in the water. I'm lying on top of it being kept buoyant by this thing. It was, it was bumping me up. I was no longer swimming. I'm lying on my back being kept afloat by this thing thinking, when is it gonna bite me? There was no shark, but there was a sea lion. And the people above looking down believed it to be keeping me afloat until the Coast Guard boat arrived behind me. He got the phone call from the hospital. And he calls his secretary, Rachel, and, and, and says, uh, Rachel, uh, my son has just jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge. I need you to ride in the passenger seat of the car because if you don't, I will drive off of a cliff. He wouldn't be able to see straight to get to the hospital. And he walks in to my room. And I'm laying there all, you know, kind of broken and bent. My IVs in both arms. I had a tube coming out of my chest. And just waterfalls flow from it. I looked up at my dad. I said, Dad, I'm sorry. And he said, no, Kevin. I'm sorry. 
And he comes over and he puts his hand on my forehead and he says, Kevin, you are going to be okay, I promise. And I never held words closer to my chest ever before. I just, I just held them. Like, okay, dad says I'm gonna be okay. I got this. My dad took me back to the bridge a year later to the date of my anniversary. And we, we stood at the very light rail that I attempted. We get to the parking lot, I don't wanna get out of the car. I don't wanna get out of the car. Dad, I can't do this, I can't do this. Kevin, we need this, you have to do this, we need closure. So we, we walk out to the bridge and he says, show me where. And I showed him the exact light rail like it happened the day before. We hold the flower over the rail. My father grabs my left hand with his right. We say in our father. And he says, drop the flower. And I dropped the flower and it wafted down and it hit the water and made the tiniest ripple effects. And two feet to the right popped up a sea lion. And it was arguably the most beautiful moment I've ever had with my dad besides him being the best man at my wedding. Now I know that no matter what I'm faced with, I will defeat it. I have chronic thoughts of suicide. They plague me. They'll never, ever take me. There's no way I'm going to take my life. I'm always going to ask for help. I travel around the world trying to help people who don't have it all, who don't have that support network, I mean, find reasons to support themselves. And if one of you is suffering and you're quiet about it, Today, tomorrow, the next, ask for help. Practice never again silencing your pain. Tell the truth about it to someone. You're not alone, and suicide is never the solution to your problems. It is the problem, and you can defeat this pain one day at a time. I'm 220 feet in the air, and I have somebody trying to get my attention. I keep yelling at him. I say, if you get any closer, that's it. Because all I got to do is nudge back. And what happens? Because somebody is four or five minutes late getting home, they roll down their window as they come by, and they yell out, jump, you SOB. What could I have done different? I was tired of living this lie. I was tired of lying to everybody. I was exhausted at who i become. I thought about the Golden Gate Bridge asked for directions. So I, I got to the Bay Bridge and, they, and I asked them for directions. I said, how do you get to the Golden Gate Bridge? But I was telling myself, okay, whoever I ask, I hope that I, when I ask them, they'll look me in my face and they'll see something inside of me and ask me, well, why are you going to the bridge? Because part of me on the inside was ready to say why I wanted to go. I mean, I was really looking for a reason to, to continue to live. I couldn't find anything. And the lady just looked at me in my face and gave me a plain look. She gave me directions. I knew it wasn't gonna be all right no more. Parked my car, left the keys in the ignition, grabbed my prepaid phone, and I got there on that bridge and I started walking. I looked over the railing, saw there was nothing that was going to stop me. I saw there was nothing in the water. But when I looked in that water, I just didn't see water, I saw peace. I saw no more nights of crying, I saw no more living a lie, I saw no more being a burden. All the things that I needed in life, I saw in that water. I took a couple steps back and in the moment as I'm heading towards the railing and about to jump over, I hear a voice. Hey, is everything all right? And in that moment, it was enough of a distraction to where I grabbed the railing and turned myself on this cord. I'm 220 feet in the air and I have somebody trying to get my attention. I'm upset, I'm yelling back and forth for him, stay back, I'm trying to keep myself warm, I'm bundled up, so I keep yelling at him. I say, if you get any closer, that's it. All, Cause all I gotta do is nudge back. Like that's all, I, not even a big nudge, just a small nudge and that's it. Finally, in my heart starts feeling like, why does you even care? Because he's not, he's not yelling at me. He's not, he's not, he's not making me feel like I'm stupid for being here. Cause everything inside of me is like, man, you're stupid, you didn't put yourself in this position, you did not come here to talk. I came here because I was in pain and I was trying to get out of it. But here after 15 minutes, this, this voice starts to penetrate me in, 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 my, in my soul and it, and it gets a little closer and I start to hear him. I never look up and in that same position on that bridge with my feet hanging off the cord and at any moment I could do this and, and it could be over. And for 92 minutes, this individual, this human, just listen to me. 
Now, think about that when I say that. For 92 minutes, he sat there, he stood there and just listened to me. So after this time, he decided on his own to come back over the rail. And I said, what did I do that helped this situation? All he told me was, you listened. You let me speak and you listened. That's all this guy was looking for and I think that's what so many people are looking for. Shortly after this incident, I received a letter from Kevin's mother. Dear Mr. Briggs, I adopted Kevin when he was only six months old, but you are one of the reasons Kevin is still with us. I truly believe Kevin was crying out for help. We truly thank God for you. Sincerely indebted to you, Narvella Berthia. It's really good. We have a choice. Are we gonna take the path of none of my business, they should handle it? Are we gonna confront them head on and say, hey, I'm seeing these things. What's going on? Let's talk. Listen to understand, that's the key. I can't honestly believe that it, with almost eight billion people on this planet, that people still feel alone. And that's why we all gotta come together. Two ears and one heart. That's what saved my life and that's what all of us in this room possess. Challenge yourself today and in the future to look out for each other. The moment, the moment people feel heard, they get healed. The moment, but they have to be heard. Listening can save people's lives and we all can do it. I got those questions. Did I live? Did I love? Did I matter? And as soon as I got that those were the questions I'm gonna evaluate myself with at the end of the life, it gave me the power of what my late mentor Wayne Dyer taught, the power of intention.